Got it. Thanks. Okay. We're ready. Cecilia, Mariela, ¿quieren grabar o no? No les pedimos permiso antes. Sí, por supuesto. Por mi parte está bien. Sí, no, okay. no hay problema. Es con propósitos de, de mantenerlo en el departamento y compartir quizás educacionalmente, no, no con otros propósitos. Gracias, muchas gracias. Perfecto, no de nada. Shall we, shall we start? So, um... Welcome to one more session of the uh, Spanish 894 eight, Colloquium. Um, uh, thanks for being here in the very gray day uh, for what I'm, what I'm anticipating a very exciting talk. And um, I'm just gonna let Professor Laura Pawalski to introduce uh, today's speakers. And Laura, the floor is yours. Thanks, Pedro. Um, I have just, a, it's not really a PowerPoint as much as just a few uh, images, right? Um, it, because I'm gonna be mentioning a lot of the wonderful work that Mariela and Cecilia have done. So I wanna kind of anchor that um, with a couple of images, right? So it's my great pleasure to introduce our two presenters for today, Dr. Cecilia Macon and Dr. Mariela Solana, who will be speaking about the affective turn under Southern eyes. Before introducing each of them, we'd like to thank the sponsors of today's talk, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Department of Political Science, and the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Without their support, this event would not have been possible. Dr. Macon has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Buenos Aires, or La Uva and an M, uh, a master's in political theory from the London School of Economics. She's an assistant professor at the UBA, the University of Buenos Aires, and has published widely on democracy, gender, violence, and affect, including the co-edited volumes Afectos Políticos with Daniela Losillo and Mapas de la Transición with Laura Cucci and the single authored book, Sexual Violence in the Argentinian Crimes Against Humanities Trials, Rethinking Victimhood, a book devoted to the analysis of the role of affect, uh, the role played by affect in testimonies of sexual violence. She's now finishing a second book, scrutinizing feminism in terms of, quote, affective disarrangements, end quote. Dr. Solana holds a PhD in, oops, yeah, um, philosophy from the University of Buenos Aires. She's an assistant professor and a member of the Gender Studies Program at the National University Arturo Jauretti. Dr. Solan is also an assistant researcher at the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research or the CONICET in Argentina and is affiliated with the Institute of Research on Gender Studies at the University of Buenos Aires. Her main research fields are gender and sexuality studies feminist theories of affect and embodiment, and feminist epistemology and the philosophy of science. She is the author of the second book here, La Notion de Subversión and Judith Butler. Dr. Macon and Dr. Solana have collaborated on a number of projects, most notably by co-editing the two volumes up on screen, Preterito Indefinido, Afectos y Emociones en las Aproximaciones al Pasado from 2015, and Affect, Gender, and Sexuality in Latin America from this year, 2021. Um, the latter was also co-edited by Naila um, Vacaresa, who could not unfortunately be here with us today. Um, both Dr. Macon and Solana participate in SEGAP. Let's see if I have here, yes, right? It's an ongoing seminar on gender, affect, and politics that does a variety of things, right? Promote, uh, it's like a network where you, uh, you know, uh, researchers on these topics, but also put together events and celebrate the work published by um, the, the members. Dr. Macon today will present on the symbolism of pañuelos blancos y verdes, connecting the Madre de Plaza de Mayo with the current movement of Ni Una Menos in the history of feminist activism in Argentina. Dr. Solana will then present on transfeminism and chronicles through the analysis of nostalgia as historical critique in Alejandro Moderelli's 
Rosa pre, eh, Prepucia, Cronicas de Sodomía, Amor y Bigudí, uh, from 2011. After their presentations, we'll have a chance to uh, have some Q&A and discussion. So thank you, uh, Drs. Macon and Solana, for being here virtually with us here today. Everybody, please join me in a round of virtual applause to welcome them. Cecilia, do you want to start out? Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Laura, for this uh, presentation. Good afternoon all here in Buenos Aires and in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank the Ohio State University for this invitation and departments that sponsored uh, this talk. We are particularly grateful, of course, to Laura Podalki and other Sarto for giving us the opportunity to share with you some of the main axes of our work devoted to affect, gender, and sexuality in Latin America, which is the title of the book Mariela and I co-edited with Naila Bacarese, who actually couldn't be here today, as Laura said. Uh, the book includes articles by Latin American and Latino scholars who try to discuss the Latin American perspective on the impact of the affected turn on gender and sexuality studies in the region, that is precisely the affected turn and their southern eyes. So today we would like first to introduce the general perspective of the book, which expresses, we hope, the Latin American point of view on the topic, and later to develop two examples of this analysis. So, uh, considering the complex and even contradictory social processes that Latin America is experiencing today, the expansion of feminist and LGTB movements on one hand, and the reactionary and that of reactionary and neoliberal forces on the other. Many Latin American authors are turning to affect to understand our present situation, revisit our history, and imagine new possibilities for the future. Though often inspired by theories established in the global north, this regional production also marks a departure from mainstream academia and draws attention to the arguments, methods, and critical contributions of Latin America. One of the great theoretical challenges when analyzing Latin American politics in explaining how and why certain countries in the region suddenly shifted towards neoliberal conservatism after the period known as the pink tie from the late 1990s to the beginning of the 2000s. Although these transformations on the Latin American political map are neither absolute nor irreversible, actually there has been a shift in Argentina and also in Peru and probably soon to be in Chile, they oblige the scholars to reconsider the theoretical tools employed to interpret social and political reality. This is precisely why the theoretical value of notions such as affect, emotion, and feeling has been recognized. Although leftist populist governments are often associated with outbursts of passion and emotional manipulation, it has become clear of late that the new predominance of the conservative right in the region cannot be attributed to straightforward or rational discourse, but to its ability to evoke a complex weave of feeling and emotion. The effective repertoire conservative parties have drawn on and reinforced includes nostalgic yearning for the past, happiness in response to change, indignation in the face of corruption, hatred for foreign girls, love to the nation, and the panic, of course, in the face of the supposedly communist offshoots of the populist governments that preceded them. The challenge for studies on political effect in Latin America is to cease the simplistic interpretation of right-wing voters as irrational or motivated solely by hatred. What is needed is to acknowledge, and this is key for us, the critical role of emotions in building political life without falling back on dualisms that contrast reason with passion, mind with body, and discourse with materiality. It is impossible to grasp the central role of gender and sexuality in contemporary political debates uh, without acknowledging the impact of the new feminisms and LGTB movements in Latin America. Legalizing abortion and same-sex marriage, ensuring comprehensive sexual education, and in violence against women, recognizes non-binary gender identities and debating traditional erotic affective customs, all struggles once limited to small groups of activists, are now general interest topics. As presented throughout our book, an analysis of affect 
proves fundamental to understanding a seeming paradox. The fact that the right wing has obtained regional hegemony on this, at the same time as feminism has attracted an increasing number of supporters and enjoys historically high levels of acceptance. Let's now remember very briefly that towards the end of the 1990s, the affected dimension progressively gained relevance in cultural, social, and political theory. Philosophy had, had of course, addressed the issue of affect systematically and from its very origins. And since the 1980s, scholars in the social sciences have also taken up the subject. However, in a, in a sort of off, offshoot of feminist and queer theory, uh, a certain sector within the field of cultural criticism began using affected term, a catchy phrase that captured their vision in the late 20th century. Presented in many cases as part of a reaction to the linguistic term, these discussions contributed to the development of a specific theoretical matrix on the question, articulating it with case studies right from the start. It is no coincidence that a great part of these debates originated within studies on gender and sexualities. In fact, from their origins, the objections to his cis heteropatriarchy and his classic dichotomy of femininity emotion on one side versus masculinity reason on the other have been key to feminism's discussions of affect. The destruction of binaries and essentialism that is core part, as we know, of LGTB studies have served as a point of departure for a great number of discussions in the field. In light of these questions, we did not attempt to merely evaluate the way in which Latin America applies certain concepts to a set of cases, but to understand its specificity from a conceptual point of view. We see this specificity as involving first the development of only some of the affected tense conceptual variants and the rejection of others, and second, a special link between theory, activism, and cultural production. It is important to know that part of the distinctiveness of the Latin American affective term arises from the way in which theoretical frameworks intersect in the region. For decades, for example, in Latin America, the tradition of analytical philosophy coexisted and was in dialogue with continental philosophy. Thus, it is a little surprise that the perspective grounded in diverse theoretical frameworks has seen such remarkable expansion. Bearing these considerations in mind, we try to avoid presenting the expansion of the field of studies on affect, gender, and sexualities in Latin America as a result of hand-me-down theories by European and North American scholars at the beginning of the century. Such an interpretation would only consolidate the region's position as a locus of passive reception for conceptual innovations produced in the global north. Simply accepting the sort of global division of labor could mean reducing Latin American complexity to the status of cases studies in light of the theories from the other latitudes. An additional repercussion is that while the global north is positioned as a producer of concepts, Latin America is portrayed as a region flooded with emotions and affect, but empty of thought. For this very reason, the feminist and queer thought gather in our volume, critically examine how theory circulates in the context of the unjust relations between the global North and South. Researchers in gender, feminist, LGTB, and queer studies have risen to this challenge, creating situated knowledge theoretical reconsiderations and conceptual vocabularies that do not fully align with the terms already established in mainstream academia. In this emerging field, scholarship is closely connected to reflections stemming from feminist and LGTB movements. So feminist scholars in Latin America have studied, for example, and this, these are just some of examples, the sexual and affective dimensions of activist women in context of political violence and dictatorship, refiguring, for example, the idea of resistance. With its effective narratives and nuances, the LGTB past has allowed other scholars to challenge the notion of an ideal present and integration politics centered on identity and marriage. Parties and affects are also central to new studies on genders and non-normative sexualities. Research, 
into femicide and there's different forms of pain and vulnerability in contexts in which gender violence is interwoven with the restructuring of the capitalist system. Black intellectuals also and activists in Brazil have reflected on the relationship between racism, sexism, and the loneliness of black women. Similarly, indigenous feminists have pondered the impact of, of patriarchy, colonialism, and racism on their bodies, their sexuality, and their effect on life. So a corpus of reflections and ongoing studies examine the way in which feminist and LGBT movements utilize effective repertoires for social transformation. In the face of persistent multiple forms of violence and annihilation under both dictatorship and democracy, all of these groups have used mourning as a form of protest. In addition to mourning, also happiness, humor, and provocation are crucial to contemporary struggles for abortion rights and against feminicides and sexual violence. Self-described feministas comunitarias, communitarian feminism, for example, and indigenous women have reflected on their political processes of a spiritual, emotional, and physical healing in response to the expropriation of their hands and knowledges. There are points of contact between the visual arts in Latin America and feminism and LGBT movements configuring another fundamental field of effective and political experimentation. In short, as we shall see in the next minutes, a review of the literature reveals that the effective political repertoire of social sexual movements in the region has been examined in some detail. Okay, so it's my turn, yeah. Um, let me share first. Um, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, first, I also want to thank Anna and Laura for this invitation and everybody who's attending uh, this event uh, for discussing these uh, things with us. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, one of the things that we agreed upon as editors was not to have a strict criteria on the vocabulary that was used throughout the book. That is, we wanted to give uh, the authors the freedom to choose how and why they employ the terms that they did. However, in the introduction that uh, we have written with Cecilia and Naila, we wanted to reflect uh, upon some of the common discussions about the terminology associated with uh, the affective term, such as affect, emotion, feelings, etc. First, it is important to note, but I'm sure you all know this, that some thinkers make a very strong difference or distinction between emotion and affect. Um, affect, understood as the ability to affect and be affected, is another word for intensity and the unmediated encounters of bodies. This is what uh, Brian Masumi and his followers suggest. Affect is unstructured, transpersonal, non-linguistic, non-intentional and non-conscious. It refers to a sensory reaction of our bodies, which are spontaneous and independent of our reflection and polish. Affect only acquires semantic contact when it becomes an emotion. That is when it is coded according to existing social and cultural norms. Therefore, it could be said that emotions are a culturally constructed expression of affect. In terms of Masumi, emotions are, and I quote, intensity owned and recognized. So uh, they are no longer a free floating flux of sensations. Emotions are fixed, personal and recognized. Having said this, it is important to keep in mind also that on, not all of the authors associated with the affective term um, make a strong uh, distinction between affect and emotion. Uh, there are important critiques of this distinction made by feminist thinkers such as Margaret Wetherell, Sarah Ahmed, Ruth Lace, Claire Hemmings, uh, Cecilia Macon, and myself. <laughs> also, there are people like Ahmed and like a lot of writers that are included in our book who prefer to use emotion and affect interchangeably to highlight the fluidity of the conceptual boundaries. 
We believe that this discussion about affect and emotion is important for several reasons. Uh, first, because it says a lot about our conceptual affiliations or theoretical affiliations. Uh, those who make a strong distinction between affect and emotion tend to describe the affective turn as a reaction to the linguistic turn, post-structuralism and social constructionism, and they question the insistence on focusing on the mediated and cultural specific nature of the body. Affect is spontaneous, surprising, and mediated, and this discourse is coded, recognized, and fixed, and we cannot use the same framework to understand both. For those who don't make a strong difference between affect and emotion, the point of the turn to affect is not to, make, uh, to move away from constructionism, but to improve it. The goal is to expand the scope of social investigation in order to focus on embodiment, pleasures, feelings, etc. It is not enough to focus on ideology, texts, and concepts. We need to pay attention to the affective realms, but we could still use the theoretical tools of cultural theory to do this. Um, so what we are trying to say in this introduction that Cecilia, Naila, and I wrote is that uh, these discussions are important because controversies uh, over conceptual terms are also political disputes within the fields of knowledge. This is our claim. And we include uh, in the introduction a, a quote that I really like by Sarah Ahmed uh, that you can read here. Uh, when the affected term is translated into a term to affect, male authors are given the status of originators of this term, which is something that in this book, uh, but also in other papers, Cecilia, Naila, and myself have rejected, that is, uh, these rhetorics of novelty and originality that is linked to the affected term. And we have tried to show that some of its discussions can be traced back to feminist and queer arguments that pre-exist the term to affect. We also wanted to add to this political critique our own impression that presented this, uh, these discussions on affect and emotion as universal is also constricting, and I would say kind of colonialist, as it overlooks uh, the way that knowledge production of affect has been done in Latin America. Most of the works included in this book use terms such as affect, emotion, and feeling without going into theoretical distinctions between them. We don't think this is a coincidence or a lack of clarity, but rather a way to move away from some versions of the affective term. It is also a sign of uh, the importance of our theoretical affiliations. Most writers in this volume have a background in feminist and queer studies, a background in cultural theory, history, and post-structuralism. And they are inspired by thinkers such as Sarah Ahmed and Judith Butler, who don't make a strong cut between bodily sensations and cultural meanings. As Ahmed herself has suggested, and I quote, the world we are describing is messy. If we have clear distinctions, we are actually losing our connections to that world. As editors, our claim is that the conceptual diversity of this book is an essential resource for expanding and deepening these debates. Before uh, moving on to the next presentation by Cecilia, we wanted to give you a, a little overview of the different parts in which the book is uh, divided. The first section of this volume is about the role of affect in political activism. This section not only addresses uh, the political agency of feminist activisms in Latin America, but also the way that conservative movements react and deploy their own affective devices. Soon Cecilia is gonna talk about her own contribution to this section, which is about the struggle for the legalization of abortion in the region, a topic that is very politically important in Latin America today. And there are actually two chapters of the book devoted to that struggle. Uh, the second uh, section uses literature and film as uh, devices to examine the role of affect in gender and sexuality politics. These chapters explore how fiction can help us rethink social issues such as reproductive rights, maternal care, gay relationships, and queer life. 
the last section focuses on the historical the character of affect and emotion. Um, the goal is not only to show the importance of gender and sexuality in national historical narratives, but also to consider how our emotions condition our understanding of the past, present and future. After Cecilia's next talk, I will give you a little glimpse of these sections when I present my own chapter, uh, which is about uh, nostalgia. Ceci? Yes, I'm sharing my screen, sorry. So, uh, as an example of one of the lines of discussion introduced in this presentation, uh, Affect and Activism, I would like to focus on one of the key issues discussed in our book, how abortion rights activism may help to understand the specificity of the Latin American affective term and of the four-way feminism in terms of the way in which current activism is linked to the recent history of the region. In other words, I'm interested in exploring the specificity of these feminisms regarding the marks left by dictatorships in the region in terms of its effective temporal dimension. So I briefly scrutinize here the characteristics acquired by the four-way feminism in Argentina and in, in Chile, based on the, anal the analysis of the online and offline activism in the struggle for abortion rights. There, I believe the way in which the present effectively connects with the recent past defines, defines its own attributes. So the Argentine massive demonstration for abortion rights in 2018 have surely been among the most visible throughout the region. Indeed, after dec a decades-long effort, Argentina legalized abortion on December 30, 2020. With three demonstrations limited by the ongoing pandemic, alternative methods to organize and spread feminist messages became central. The bill was passed in both houses of Congress by a great margin than expected, but it had been two years since the original bill written by activists over the course of almost four decades was heard in the chamber of the National Congress from the, from the, for the first time. Then in in, in 2019, the Senate rejected the law after it was passed in the Chamber of Deputies. But nevertheless, the demonstrations that ensued mark a milestone in the Latin American politics. Adolescents, middle-aged women, and long-time militants occupied the streets and virtual arenas in an unprecedented form. In a way, the events of 2020 fulfilled the feeling of historical inevitability that was born in 2018. In those two years, a hashtag representing a desire, que sea ley, make it law, became a, a hashtag of certainty, que sea ley, it will be law. And then in a radical present, a soy, it is today. While the logic of progress is guided by a promise effectively associated to optimism, historical inevitability implies the transposition of the expected future, future to the present, as a dimension that already happened. The promised prospect is literally here, despite interest that would rather hide this temporary overlapping. It was precisely the spirit of inevitability that involved a highly disruptive, effective contact with the living past of the local movement, but also with recent Argentine history. I'm interested in examining the critical role of online activism at the juncture in the campaign to legalize abortion in Argentina, and particularly how this activism managed to constitute what was, in more than one sense, a massive and transversal collective in which a centrally affected, but at the same time strategic path of connection with the past became pivotal. This connection with the past occurred in two ways through the construction of an intergenerational bond, and by the way in which it linked current feminist activism with the struggle against and resistance to state terrorism during the last dictatorship. This, moreover, transpired under a logic in which these two forms are interconnected in their own outline of a specific way of embodying agency. Here we face a kind of link between the current protests and the recent traumatic, traumatic 
lived or immediate Latin American past in light of an association with the most recent catastrophe that can help to conceptualize it as both a motor and a characteristic of fourth wave Latin American feminism. What is more, this affective temporality imposes the constitution of a new mode of intervening politically through a relationship with what has only recently been from the past, particularly with protagonists of recent Argentine history who still participate in current demonstrations. This is to say, we do not face here a merely phantasmal presence of the past. Given this, as I will attempt to show, the recent or living history of state terrorism becomes connected with the living history of the local feminist movement, and in a particular interaction with on and offline strategies that specifically make up the fourth wave. Argentine second wave feminists made a legalization for, of abortion part of the local movement's agenda in the mid-1970s. This timing requires us to shed light on a clear link between pro-legalization activism in Argentina and resistance to the dictatorship. Specifically, in 1975, activists generated a campaign with the slogan Stop Clandestine Abortion, a project interrupted by the beginning of the civic military coup that took place in Argentina in 1976. I find it important to underline here that in contrast with what has occurred in parts of Europe and North America, where abortion activism was born and sustained through a number of general political openings, the civil rights struggle, debates over discrimination, student movements. In Argentina, this activist initiative was contemporaneous with implementation of state terrorism and was moreover a target of repression, disappearance, torture, and sexual violence on the part of the state. The simultaneous nature of these events is not merely anecdotal, but I think rather marks both the methods of intervention as well as the kind of ties that contemporary activism has made with its founder. It is relevant to note at this point that the green scarf, Argentine activist successful symbol for the legalization of abortion created in 2003, is a resignification of the white scarf worn by the mothers of Plaza de Mayo. This was not a casual adoption, but rather a reclaiming of the mother's collective as a key component of women's militancy. A link was being established between the fight for abortion rights and the crimes of dictatorship. A clear link to a recent history marked by state terror was unearthed, and this, I believe, gave que sea ley, let be law, power, persistence, size, and certain specific characteristics. In fact, in 2010, a request was published demanding legalization under a slogan that was replicated at large in 2019 and in 2020. Legal abortion, democracies, tet. As, as I try to show here, the kinds of images shared across social networks not only reinforced the slogan and its implication, but also illustrated that it was this effective contact with the movement's living past that was made that, that made a path for its effective rebellion. In light of this scenario, I will quickly examine some of the images inspired by recent feminist history that circulated under the thesis hashtags and which I suggest constitute a sort of counter archival feelings. I would like to present one of the historical photos that circulated most widely online during the movement. The iconic image of the feminist activist Maria Elena Donner, right on our right, up on our right, on the steps of the Congress on March 8, 1984, the first Women's Day to be observed following the return to democracy. In the image, she holds a banner that reads, no to maternity, yes to pleasure. The continuous circulation of this photograph made it a central element of the 2019 and 2020 moment. It was an image clearly imbued, intersected with anger, defiance, pride, and irony, and which exhibited a tense superimposition of pleasure and transgression. In this sense, it is important to note that in 2019, an archive of photos of that first Women's Day and the democracy began to circulate widely under a thread that put particular emphasis on the fact that during that morning of 1984, 
The streets of Buenos Aires appear covered with images of women who had been detained and disappeared during the dictatorship. The retweeted images of all the women participating in the march circulated over the course of several days in numbers comparable to or greater than those of adolescents. Given this, I would like to highlight that many photographs were accompanied by text that re read, what I didn't have for myself will be for them, and the traditional, a 97 years old, I still have to protest for this. A similar perspective on the effect of construction of a social collective that breaches time is also apparent in the photograph of a young woman and an elderly woman with her, and I would like to go back uh, here. So this is the, the picture. So it's the photograph of a young woman and an elderly woman with her fist raised, the green scarf tied around her twist. It is an arch of tension woven with happiness and anger nostalgia and hope, horror and survival. The space of resistance formed in, a, formed in a bond with a living past like what constitutes a bond between the street and the social network. The ways in which historical leaders became key figures in social networks during this moment is exemplified in the powerful circulation of a photograph in which key historical activists, the, the, the second picture on this slide, who are, survivors of the, who are survivors of the dictatorship are seen immersed in a dancing tide of protesters or walking on the sidewalk next to the National Congress hours before the law was passed. These images and their circulation foreground the links between online and offline activism. There is an unquestionable proximity both between the bodies of the founders in the streets and the bond with the present which also connects to the reason lived past. Joy, defiance, rage, impatience are collectively embodied in a common gesture. This is an archive of demands that sustains the continuity of the present with the past in such a way that it does not engender the past either as a remote instance still in need of resolution, nor as a strictly present day trauma. Rather, it renders the past a fleeting but carnal and affective context illustrated through the presence of persons introduced as insistent, insistent activists rather than merely survivors or spectral figures. The vividness of the past becomes an engine of political intervention, not in spite of these tensions, tensions but because of them. At some point, these examples refer to an activism that constitutes a kind of bond with the past that does not try to present such past as something that has been overcome but rather as a mountain action that generates a community built emotionally on a temporality superimposed with figures that cease to exist as ghosts in order to revive and sustain the past. The conclusions reached so far raise a question. Is the type of link established in the Argentine case the only possible way to explain the relationship between contemporary Latin American feminist activism and its recent past? The answer is, of course, no. A brief examination of the Chilean case will help me to stress that the effective temporal dimension of the relationship with the recent past is key to characterize feminist act activism in the region, but that there are different ways to express such relationship. If in the Argentine case, the activism of the present gains momentum by going back to traumatic events in the past, the Chilean mobilizations embody the fact that it has been feminism that has brought out the silence uh, of silence, the demands against state terrorism and neoliberal policies. As we shall see, feminist mobilizations here were the driving force behind the massive protests initiated in October 2019 against the policies of the dictatorship and their continuity in democracy. I would now like to briefly introduce an analysis of the way in which in recent years, Chilean feminist struggles also reshaped, but in a different way than in Argentina, their relationship with state terrorism. In this case, I believe feminist activism was to a large extent the driving force behind the mobilization started in 2019 under the slogan, Chile woke up, Chile despertó. That is to say, the proximity of terror did not change feminist activism in its own way, 
but rather feminist activism promoted the mass mobilizations against the neoliberal order and focused on a state terrorism that had been minimized until then by large part of Chilean politics. Abortion, as we probably know, is not yet legal in Chile, defined as a crime in the criminal code in, of uh, 1874, a number of exceptions were recognized in 1931, where later over these exceptions were later overruled by the Pinochet dictatorship in 1999. In other words, the Terrell Institute in, Institute in those years is directly responsible for a setback in rights. In 2017, a law was passed legalizing abortion in cases of rape, fetal non viability, and risk to the mother's life. That is nothing more than a mere return to 1931. In 2021, the bill decriminalizing abortion up to 14 weeks raised to parliamentary status for the first time and was approved by the Chamber of Deputies in September of this year. But as of today, uh, uh, but as of today its resolution is still pending, as we probably know. It is therefore a journey marked by a Pinochet's progression and by a democratic order established, as, as we know, by a negotiated and moderate transition. This direct responsibility of the dictatorship for the setback and the inability of the neoliberal democratic order to push forward the abortion agenda resulted in an activism with an identity of its own. Indeed, after decades in which feminisms expressed themselves through both popular and middle-class organizations. As from the year 2000, feminist groups that explicitly opposed Washington consensus policies and the neoliberal order sprang up. This chain of, chain of rallies, which culminated with the great 2018 protest cycle and is vividly conveyed in the metaphor of the tsunami, not only rose general awareness of the demands, but it was also responsible a year later or jolting Chile from the apathy into which the neoliberal order had made it sink. A key component for, of abortion rights activism was precisely the challenge to the logic of waiting that is also associated with a neoliberal order based on the demand for present sacrifices in exchange for future promises. As in the case of the Argentine rallies of 2020 and 2018, uh, the experience of historical inevitability appears here as well, although under another type of affective counter archiving. It is a matter of activating the relationship between past, present, and future under the sign of political virulence. This is how fury spread over the demonstration. A fury that left its mark upon the Chile Desperto a year later. In these mobilizations, the recording of videos, songs, and poems that was viral was crucial to the creation of an effective atmosphere where the rejection of waiting is tied to rage. So in order to account, so in order to account for this particular effective atmosphere, I would like to focus on one of the interventions that was part of this shift and overlapping as well of feminist demands towards those that have imposed a real threat to the established order in Chile after the dictatorship. A case in which the challenge of the logic of waiting and the introduction of historical inevitability are associated with rage and weariness. I am referring to the poem transformed into viral video, Rabia, Rage, by Malu Gonzalez Cortez. This poem shows precisely how this effective atmosphere is presented as the backbone of the rallies. And I'm quoting briefly. I am the, de the indebted one, the jaded one, the hopeless one. I am the one to whom Chile didn't text back. And the one who blocked it so as not to be in so much pain. I am the abortionist, the crazy one. I am also the idealist, the one who prefers to die poor than stop being an artist. I am the one who marches proudly showing her tits. I am the magician, the hysteric, the scandalous one. I am the one who dances until my buttocks grab the tile. I am the body that your ancestors repressed. I am the remains that they threw into the sea and got lost. These passages of the poem written in a feminist vein that makes the demand for abortion a central issue refer to boredom, scandal, dance, 
the harassment of oblivion as a matrix of mobilization. Precisely, no son 30 pesos, son 30 años. It's not 30 pesos, it's 30 years. One of the most widely used slogans uh, across the social media. So to underscore what should have been evident, that the protest did not stem from a mere 30 pesos increase in the subway fare, of course, but represent the awakening of those 30 years of lethargy. Three decades of a past that sank in apathy and inaction, that feminisms activated with the refusal to wait, and the awakening of anger, but also of hope. It is this affective atmosphere impregnated by a sense of inevitability that was in charge of linking this feminist present with the silence past of terror. So, while in the Argentine case, the social collective connects with the past, bringing to the present a capacity of action that was truncated, in the Chilean example, it is about building these practices by making visible the past impregnated by the terror of the dictatorship. Okay, so uh, you may think that we are obsessed with the past because my paper is also about a recent past, uh, but um, I think it's an important uh, thing to understand our present, our political present, how we relate to the past, of course, and this is what I, I will try to show here. So basically my paper in uh, the book is called Nostalgia as Historical Critique, Time and Desire in Alejandro Modarelli's Rosa Prepucio. Rosa Prepucio, uh, or Foreskin Pink, is a book published in 2011 by the Argentine queer writer, journalist, and activist Alejandro Modarelli. It is an eclectic collection of chronicles, memoirs, and letters written from the perspective of several uh, fictional characters. It is a book full of nostalgia for the past, but, and for me, this is very important, that nostalgia is expressed through a humorous camp and kitsch style that makes the book sad and funny at the same time. The fictional characters of the book are identified as locas. And what do we mean by locas? Locas is one of the most important figures of same-sex relationships during the 70s and 80s in Latin America. They are often described as effeminate or feminine masculine, uh, sorry, homosexual men. They are better understood in relationship to chongos, their masculine lovers, who can either be gay or straight. Unlike locas, uh, the masculinity of chongos is not questioned because of their penetrative and active role in sexual intercourse. The relationship between locas and chongos is based on their mutual opposition, the feminine loca and the masculine chongo. And as Modarelli says in an interview, it is, and I quote, a love between water and oil, a trash love between queens and hooligans. In that same interview, Modarelli says that his book, Rosa Prepucio, is a reflection about time, or more specifically, and I quote, a reflection about a way of living homosexuality that seems old fashioned today, but refuses to disappear. According to a very uh, commonsensical narrative about homosexuality in Argentina, there was a shift in the eighties from the culture of locas and chongos to a new gay culture, not based on oppositional roles, the female chong, uh, loca and masculine chongo, but on egalitarian gender expressions, gay gay. Locas seem out of time and out of place today, but as Modarelli shows, they are still here as haunting anachronisms. What is surprising about these characters is that they feel nostalgia for a time which is usually considered less open to sexual dissidents than the present. They long for a time when same-sex encounters were clandestine and persecuted, and when their sexual meetings in public places often ended in police raids. Modarelli's Locas present us with a difficult but important question. How can anyone feel nostalgia for a time of repression? 
Uh, but my interest in nostalgia is not so much about the past, but about the present. I take Rosa Prepucio as an opportunity to reflect on the affective responses to recent cultural, political, and legal changes in the situation of the LGBTQ community in Argentina. In particular, I show that the book's nostalgic tone could be considered a form of historical critique, that is, a way to question historical accounts of sexuality in Argentina grounded on the ideas of triumph and progress. As I stated before, nostalgia in Rosa Prepucio is triggered by recent changes in sexual sociability among gay men in Argentina after the democratic transition of 1983. According to a popular narrative about our sexual past, there was a shift in the 80s from a homosexual model or locatongo model to a gay model or gay gay model. The locatongo model was constituted by the effeminate and passive loca and the masculine and active chongo. And the gay model implied a more egalitarian sexual pairing of men with similar gender expressions. It also entailed an importation of an American way of being gay that was considered more clean or cleaner, sorry, respectable and homonormative. Before that, during 1976 and 1983, Argentina suffered its most brutal and bloody dictatorship to date. During that time, uh, homosexual and trans people were persecuted by the state and the police by squad. Male sexual encounters took place in clandestine and secretive conditions, tea rooms, saunas, public restrooms, movie theaters, and private parties. Democracy brought about important political, social, and cultural transformation for the gay community. It entailed a decrease in clandestinity and police raids, a more accepting social attitude to one sent towards same-sex relationships, and the appearance of, a multi of multiple LGBTIQ organizations that based their demands on the increasingly popular discourse of human rights. And this is why it is often uh, considered uh, uh, this transition as a positive or progressive one. Mother Ellis Chronicles and their nostalgic tone put this historical optimist common sense into question by showing that the new gay culture entailed its own exclusions. And here's one example of this exclusion in a testimony by Aloca called La Ramona, which is included in another book by Modarelli and Flavio Ratizardi, Fiestas Bañas y Exilios, that you can see here. Uh, La Ramona uh, remembers that some of her friends have decided to go dancing at Contramano, a very popular gay club in the late 1980s in Buenos Aires, only to realize that they no longer fit in. And I'm going to read this quote from the book, this testimony. There, I started to feel that things had really changed and that there was something ridiculous about us. You could see different maricas circulating everywhere, and they look at us with sarcastic smiles. La Chola was mocked more than once by those guys with mustaches. Anyway, what bothered me about that night was in the air. When we entered the club, they looked at us as if we were aliens. Contramano was filled with lumberjack shirts, mustaches, and guys dancing as they were fight billy goats fighting for an imaginary female. Obviously, we went home alone. However, um, Modarelli's writings manages to undermine the linear development of the loca chongo gay gay narrative by showing the persistence of locas today. Locas may be out of fashion, but they are not gone. They are still here as haunting anachronisms. It also shows uh, that this shift, which, is, which for some has represented a social and political victory, for others has entailed, for others have entailed new sexual exclusions based on class, age, and looks. In my paper, I focus mainly on the first two chronicles of the book written uh, by two fictional logas, Betty Book and the Goddess on Bended Knee. Both chronicles express a nostalgia for the golden age of sexual encounters in tea rooms, the public restrooms of railroad stations where locas and chongos could hook up. But the first one is written by a sexually retired loca, and the second one by a loca who is not quite ready to stop being sexual. Uh, so in the first chronicle, Betty Boop, 
paints a visceral and sensory picture of the gone world of children's sex. And uh, you can uh, read uh, a quote uh, by Betty Book here about uh, nostalgia. Um, she questions also in this chronicle the alleged improvements for gay people that the present has uh, represented as she idealizes the old tea rooms and their endless possibilities for casual sex, she rejects current gay sexual circuits of bars and clubs. She claims that these places ostracize locas. Uh, she says that the exclusion of locas from the new gay scene is not only based on age, but also on looks and class. And I quote, they are bothered by the old fag, the ugly fag, the poor fag. Betty Boop, prefers to withdraw from the contemporary sexual scene. And I quote, I imagine myself having sex now and I say, it is not natural at my age. I feel disgusting. I am like the hunchback of Notre Dame, ugly and hidden. Her testimony built around feelings of shame and embarrassment shows that the demand to feel pride that is so popular today may not work for everyone. The second piece of Rosa Prepucio is actually a set of letters written by the goddess to an imaginary younger gay man who finds the old locus shameful. Her letters are a testimony to how difficult it is growing old in the queer community. For her, nostalgia is not about dwelling in the past, but rather about contesting today's ageist desexualization. The ultimate challenge posed by the goddess is her refusal to be part of a historical narrative that confines Locas to the role of past heroes. She doesn't want to be recognized for what she has done for younger generations. She wants to be accepted as a rightful sexual being today. Both chronicles manifest nostalgia for the old world of sex in public restrooms and for a time when, in spite of the repression and state violence, they had greater opportunities for hooking up. The homage that Locas paid to the tea rooms clashes with the negative political meanings that uh, some gay people ascribe to them today. For instance, and this is a quote um, in a book by Mekia, who collects a lot of testimonies of um, older uh, gay men. If that was what the discriminatory society wanted for homosexuals, the tea rooms, therefore, by definition, it cannot be what homosexuals want. Um, also, both chronicles show the generational break between the old locas and the, new, and the younger gay men and the difficulties of being an old queen in a world that idealizes youth. Nostalgia in this book is not an affective mood directed only towards the past, but rather a response to the exclusion of locas in the present. Um, before suggesting some of the ways in which the book uh, can help us rethink how the history of sexuality has been told in Argentina, I would like to explain briefly why I think nostalgia could be considered an, a critical affective historical instrument. I am following here the work of Svetlana Boyne, but also Caroline Dinshon and Linda Hutchin. It may seem odd to say that nostalgia has critical value because uh, nostalgia has really bad press. In relation to history, nostalgia is sometimes depicted as a sentimentalist approach to the past or a subjective way of representing the past. Um, this, in turn, prevents any objective understanding of past events, uh, which is important for historic historiography, for instance. In political terms, the problem is that nostalgia is often considered the emotion of conservatism, an attempt to restore a better world that was only better for a privileged few. Nostalgia is also portrayed as a pathological fixation with the past, a sort of escapism that overlooks urgent current affairs. But for me, there is good nostalgia and bad nostalgia, and modernist nostalgia is interesting and useful because it is not restorative and it is not conservative. I claim that it is ironic and uh, it is an ironic and reflective kind of nostalgia. And here I am following Boehm and Dinsha in this characterization of nostalgia. In contrast to non-ironic nostalgias, which idealizes the past and turn it into a site of originality, ironic nostalgia simultaneously idealizes the past 
and makes fun of his own idealization. Moving away from any attempt to grasp the past as it was, if there is such a thing. And I think that the use of kitsch and camp style is what make Molarelli's nostalgia work this way. In the book, parody and idealization go hand in hand. Locas make fun of themselves, the, their tongos, uh, the tea rooms, and other locas. Their mockery, however, is not the same as that one expressed by homophobic people. Their parody is born out of love and respect, not out of hate or disdain. In contrast, in contrast to restorative nostalgia, which tries to go back to an allegedly better past, reflective nostalgia puts that possibility into question. Locas do not intend to bring the old world of tea room back to life. They look at the past to find traces of cultural possibilities that can help us challenge our present today. Maybe there is a tendency towards idealization and sentimentalism in the nostalgic tone of Rosa Prepucio. That is true. Maybe the chronicles do not pass the test of objectivity that professional history seems to require. But is this really a problem? I think that the key question is, what do we expect from uh, nostalgia? Do we want nostalgic literature to give us a true and objective account of the past? Or do we want to use it to ignite our historical and political imagination today? And I think this is what Modarelli is doing. I think uh, the historical and political value of Rosa Prepucio lies, lies in, the, in its ability to call attention to three issues. Uh, and with this, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish my presentation. First, uh, Modarelli's work reveals what is left left behind in those narratives that talk about a shift from a homosexual to a gay model. For instance, uh, what is left behind is that locals are still here, but they haunt the present and as sexual anachronisms. Locals are what uh, Elizabeth Freeman, a queer author, has called a temporal drag a figure associated with retrogression, delay, and the put of the, the past on the present. The second issue is about uh, the pressure in the gay culture to turn shame into pride, which is also usually linked to uh, progressive historical accounts. The locus of Rosa Prepucio are not about pride. Instead, what they demand is respect for the melancholy, and this is a quote uh, by a fictional look. The book uh, confronts the optimistic tone of these historical narratives, <laughs> but this uh, does not necessarily mean that it claims that the LGBTIQ community is worse off than before. What it shows is that neither the present nor the past are mere happy times or sad times. What is overshadowed in progressive narratives is the affective ambiguity and mixed feelings that accompany any political and social moment. Social gains do not necessarily translate into emotional bliss, and the improvement, improvements that democracy brought about are not necessarily democratically distributed. Finally, when locusts such as the goddess claim that they don't want to be past heroes but sexual beings today, they're calling attention to two things, the desexualization of other people in our sexual imagination and the limits of a political agenda based solely on legal, social, or economic achievements. Look at show how ridiculous it is to neglect sex in, in, in sexual politics. Their nostalgia for the tea rooms show that they don't want just rights, they want sex. And this is not trivial. It is a way to expand our notion of the political to include desire and pleasure as legitimate demands. To sum up, nostalgia in this this book is not so much about returning to the past, but rather about recognizing the temporal drags and anachronisms that haunt the present. Locus bring to the fore what is left behind in historically optimistic narratives, and they use nostalgia not as a road to go back in time, but rather as a key to imagine new possibilities for the queer community in the present and the future. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm sorry about the noise. Uh, my kids are screaming and crying. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you so much, both of you. Um, we do have time for um, at least 20 minutes or, or less, 10 minutes uh, for questions and answers. I know that um, if any of you want to make a question in Spanish, they can answer in Spanish. Uh, I haven't done interpretation before, but if um, the translation is needed, I will do my best. And if I <laughs> make a mistake, Laura, please save me. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for uh, your presentations. Um, great. We do have the ebook in the library if you want to check them. So, uh, and I open the floor for questions and comments or the chat. Um, for the people who are here in the room, I uh, suggest that if you have your own computer, you can use it to ask your question. Otherwise, if I can help my computer, but please let me any questions from the room pedro or comments or no questions no comments if you do not have questions i do okay go ahead mika mika uh. Hi, thank you again for your presentation. Um, really enjoyed them. Uh, I have to say that uh, I was coming anyway to the colloquium, but uh, since Anna emailed me yesterday about uh, the conversation, it, it encouraged me to reread uh, the, some of the articles of the book. And basically I started with, uh, with uh, so I'm beginning by the end. So with the nostalgia one. Uh, and I really, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't have the power right now to begin to express, uh, to articulate something about it, but I'm deeply interested in uh, what you were talking about and the ironic and the reflective nostalgia. Uh, in my head, I don't know why, but it sounds, uh, I mean, I like it. I like the idea, I like it very much. Uh, and there's definitely something that I agree with, and I don't, I don't know what, up to what extent. Uh, I know that nostalgia seems, uh, I, I guess I have to keep reading, uh, that nostalgia seems like a good looking back or es una mirada hacia atrás feliz, digamos, uh, but at the same time, I know that you've been talking, uh, you talked about uh, these two, the ironic and reflective nostalgia, and I'm at some point, I may have to talk about it with you all. So uh, not a question, it's, I hate this, but it's more a comment than a question. And thank you again. I don't know if you wanna answer, if we get some questions and comments first and then we address them, so. Um... Uh, if I may say just a, a little thing, uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean, Miguel. Is it Miguel? Yeah. Um, I think that, that the work of Svetlana Boim and, and Caroline Dinsha, I don't know if you if you read uh, or if you know them, but Caroline Dinsha is a historian, well, maybe you know her, a historian, a queer historian. Uh, and and Boim has done a great uh, work on nostalgia. Um, for me, it was very eye-opening because um, uh, with Cecilia, we, we we worked a lot on history, on history and historical accounts. And usually, when when and when you when you read about our, our relationship to the past, uh, when when you uh, I used to um, read a lot on, and heard a lot. Uh, okay, this is not nostalgia, this is something else. Every time I, I, I read the word nostalgia in, in, in philosophy of history, for instance, it was like, oh, this is not nostalgia. Like they were, uh, they were trying to um, uh, uh, make a distinction between what they were doing and nostalgia. So I thought, why is nostalgia uh, so bad, you know? And, and for me, their, their work, uh, the intro and poem was really useful because they showed that um, there are different sorts of nostalgias 
nostalgic uh, representations. Uh, so um, they are trying to to uh, stress how important it is to understand our affective uh, attachment to the past. That's it. Sometimes uh, articulated through nostalgia, not only nostalgia, but it's one of the uh, possible emotions that you can have towards the past in a way that is not uh, so problematic, you know, like uh, conservative or trying to restore the past. But uh, for me, uh, what is useful is that they try and show that the connection between this affective uh, uh, relationship to the past uh, moment and the critique of the present. So, um, uh, and when I read Alejandro Moderelli's book, which is full of nostalgia, but a very, a very queer nostalgia. As, uh, I didn't go into that, but I think it's a very queer form of nostalgia. I thought, oh wait, this, this is great because you, you cannot say that Morelli is a conservative, you know, uh, right wing uh, man who's trying to restore a, a, a better world for a privileged few. He's doing something else. So uh, for me, it was very um, interesting to see how nostalgic I have different uh, political uh, values. And this is something that Cecilia and I are also uh, working on a lot uh, to, um, to try to think of affect not as having a, a fixed political content, content, good or bad, you know, for oh, joy is good and, and rage is bad or, you know, sadness is bad, but to see how uh, this affect uh, actually work and what they do in a more performative sense of, of affect. And maybe you can have like a, a, an affect that has really bad press, like, um, I don't know, envy, that is something that Cecilia has worked on and show that maybe you can have interesting political value or, or rage or whatever. And also show that other uh, affects or emotions that enjoy a lot of good press, like happiness, uh, can also be very uh, uh, problematic, like Sarah Ahmed has shown. So uh, that this is part of, the, of that project. I just wanted to say that. Um, Alisa has included a common question in the chat. Can you talk more about the use of humor in feminist activism? I assume that it's for both. And then Laura. Well, I, I just needed to read. Thanks. Laura, do you wanna go ahead and, and give your, your question and so they can address probably later and tie both or? Como quieren, I mean, go ahead and answer Alisa's uh, comment or provocation and I can come in later if there's time. I don't know if any of you wanna uh -huh. tackle the humor in, act in feminist activism. And, and I assume Alisa, you are mixing both presentations. Yeah, well, so yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, just a little bit and then I can, yeah. Do you want to talk first? No, no. No, no, okay. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's a very interesting topic. I, uh, for a while I was obsessed about humor in, 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 in feminism in general because there's this, you know, also stereotype of the, that feminist, we, we don't have sense of humor that uh, now that feminism is so popular for instance in Argentina and I hear this a lot in, uh, when I do workshops or classes on gender, you know, this critique of, well, now you can't, there's no humor now. We cannot say anything funny. We, we cannot make any jokes because feminists are gonna get, you know, offended or whatever. And I think that's such a, a, a bad understanding of feminism. I think it's so full of humor, uh, feminism today, and it's so uh, politically useful. Um, in online feminism, I think Cecilia knows a little bit more about this uh, with the use of memes and stuff like that. Uh, and, but also, I, I, I wrote a paper recently about um, a podcast that I strongly recommend, which is called The Guilty Feminist. Um, it's amazing. And it's really interesting because it's what I call uh, uh, meta-feminist humor, because it's, it's humor about how we are feminists, uh, about our own contradictions as feminists, you know, how can, uh, like, uh, I am a feminist, it starts like this, uh, with a lot of com uh, different uh, female comedians saying, I am a feminist, but, uh, I don't know, I love um, Pretty, uh, Pretty Woman, the, the movie with uh, Richard Gere and stuff like that, and I wanna, you know, which is problematic, and stuff like that, 
could show our contradictions as feminists, but with a lot of humor and trying to make fun of our uh, contradictions. So I think humor is very useful to, to, um, to and to, you, to do it um, uh, in a way that usually is not uh, so uh, um, considered in public, you know, this idea of the, the, of the female, which is also, uh, for instance, for Ahmed, the feminist skill show is, is uh, an important figure to, to understand the feminist critiques, but I think um, we can also have, we, we can also do a lot of criticisms through humor and it is done, uh, well, at least for the feminist circles that I uh, associate myself with. We, we cannot hear to you, you're, you're on mute. Sorry, yeah. No. So I would like to briefly, I don't know, I know we don't have much time, but I would like to answer the question relating to the previous one by, by Miko, uh, at a sort of conceptual level. I know there is a tension between the idea of irony and affect. And I believe uh, that more than attention is the sort of productive relationship uh, that helps to understand this overlapping between emotion, feeling, and affect, and the impossibility to address to affect as an isolated field from the linguistic uh, sphere, in a way, uh, on one hand. And, and this you know, idea, I think, is related to the, the, the question about humor and feminism, because uh, the use of humor in current uh, Latin American feminism is crucial, I believe. That many of the uh, posts and tweets uh, produced during the activism in the last years is full with this overlapping of different effects and with an effective relation to the past that uh, expresses uh, the exceptional past uh, of Latin America in terms of studying terrorism and how this relates to agency. But on the other hand, this effective relationship with the past that connects with uh, what uh, Mariela said uh, uh, recently uh, also reflects, is reflected in the use of humor in, in the Chilean case in relationship to race. If you, had, if you have the opportunity to listen or to read the whole poem about race, Rage is con continuously overlapped with uh, humor, with irony. So I believe that these are examples of the way, I mean, the irony on humor are in constant tension with effort. I can reframe a way to uh, be agents in, in the world, to, to relate uh, affect with agency, thanks to this meta uh, linguistic uh, dimension that in a way expresses irony or humor. Thank you, Laura. I will write my comment in the chat. So my, um, my question has to do with the proposal at the beginning of the importance, which I completely agree with, with decolonizing the affective term, right? And from your presentations, one of the things that I took away um, was the notion of how progress, right? that, that, that notion of progress is rethought, is reconsidered, right? Is jerked around in different ways, whether it's in the book, yes, um, or in the work of activists, right? On the street and online. But I'm wondering if there are other ways of decolonizing the effective turn. So one of my own interests has been in thinking about traditions of feeling, right? Or of sentimental education. And that's you know partially because of my own work on Latin American filmmaking, right? Um, I just think that there are, there are ways of thinking about traditions of feeling, right? And that could lead us to the, because I'm I am a Delusian, right? I'm, I come from Masumi, so I do I find useful this difference between affect and emotion, right? I find that a, a useful thing in my work. Um, but I think that thinking about traditions of feeling, tradition, sentimental education, and situating those as 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 one way of decolonizing the effective term, but also as you also have done is is situating um, any. Um, uh, the first circulation of affect and feeling in a historical horizon, right? Because these are, aren't 
uh, you know, unleashed, right? They happen in one particular uh, uh, moment, right? Um, where it could be a, a moment of great anxiety, right? And maybe we don't want to talk about zeitgeist, but right. So it's it's situating things historically, right? Is is another way, and it, that's simply something that I, you know. Uh, I find very useful, but I was also wondering if you guys could elaborate a little bit more now about what are some of the ways that we can decolonize the effective term other than what you already have done, which is great. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just added a, a, another comment question, but without question explicitly, but um, I do differentiate affect, feeling, and emotion. Um, just to keep the dynamic, uh, the transformation from one into another, uh, and, and to highlight the production of meaning through enjoyment. And I don't know if you have any specific, I know that um, uh, Cecilia has done a little bit of reflection in, in your article on the yes. parts. Yes, very um, briefly, because uh, but, but I, I, know, think, yes. but uh, I think yes, uh, I, I, I would like to stress that I find the distinction between affect, emotion and feeling very fruitful in many ways. And there are in some cases uh, we refer to affect in some cases to emotion. I mean, conceptually, the distinction is really fruitful. But uh, at least in my case, in uh, referring to, to my work, it's very interesting to me to uh, elaborate how affective atmosphere, for example, or how affect changes. Uh, because the dynamic of affect many times seems to be uh, beyond the political arena or beyond our intentions or beyond the subjectivity or beyond agency. So my interest is, for example, in a concept such as affective agency, it's not just uh, the way in which affect or emotions, I, I, I think that's affect in this case, affect is palpable action, which is very important. It's one way to analyze this issue, but also how affective agency explains the way the affective atmosphere, for example, change the dynamic of the uh, affective, uh, strata in a way and how affect and emotions relate uh, in building in constituting agency yes definitely um weather owl for me has helped me a lot with the notion of affective practices the australian um yes theorist i, I think she does a, a great great illuminating work um putting together different things that um, most of the time remained as you said in your presentation also, uh, linked to male authors that uh, highlight the intensity and just leave it to the body reactions. And there's not any, any saying in the social sphere. Thank you. You're welcome. Any comments, questions? I know what we are over our time and Laura's question, other ways of decolonizing um, the effective turn. I don't know if you want to say anything else about that. Um, I think that's daring. <laughs> we yeah. Were, yes, we it were. It could be a, a project for for a, our next book. <laughs> but it's, yes, it's it's, it's, a, it's quite a, a a big question. I don't even know how to begin to answer it. Uh, um, I had today uh, a class on. Uh, I'm teaching feminism, and I had a class on uh, mujeres creando. And so the, the use of humor to decolonize and depatriarchalize and the, um, and the different strategies that uh, these people use in the streets um, just to work with uh, humorously uh, criticizing and denouncing and, and making visible um, all these effective practices that they can put together. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. One of the questions they, that I had in the class was like, what, what does a conservative feminist um, effective practice look like? Because if, if a Mujeres Creando would be the example of um, the anarchic uh, side, what, what would be the, 
the opposite, because there are conservative feminist movements. Definitely, we know that. <laughs> um, any other comments or questions? If there are no more comments or questions, I just uh, want to thank you very, very much for your uh, wonderful, wonderful <clears throat> lectures. Thank you for the books. Thank you for all your contributions. Keep on working and we'll, we'll keep in touch for probably um, new works on humor, decolonizing, and, and feminist effective practices. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you again to the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, uh, department the Department of Political and Science and the Department of Science Women, and Gender, and Gender and Sexuality Gender. Studies to Wonderful. get our sponsors in. Yeah. Exactly. Um, thank you thank so you. much, Laura, for helping with that. Thank you, Pedro and thank Michelle. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Annabel Sarto, for organizing this event. And thank you to both of the speakers on behalf of the students and myself and Michelle who are here in the classroom. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being Thank here. They are online, offline. Uh, we'll keep in Thank you. Thank you for the I hope we can keep on uh, debating and, and carry on these conversations in the future with your group. Definitely. Bye -bye. That would be one Let's of the events. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you.